thank you all for coming out. I hope everyone got the handouts from the back um, because the two recipes that we're making tonight are in there and those are the two recipes that you may have just sampled. So that blueberry jam is the blueberry jam we're making. Those pickles are the recipe of pickles that we're making. Um, and what you will, you will see in those recipes, these are called small batch recipes. You don't have to make a ton. Um, if I'm making blueberry jam at home, I'm taking that recipe and I'm like quadrupling it because I'm doing a whole day of canning. Um, but most of the recipes in the books are for smaller batches because they know people are busy and they don't have tons of time or it's just one or two people in your household. So they give you the opportunity of doing something small. So when you see how much we can tonight, it might say, oh, that really doesn't look like a lot. I wanted to stay with the small batch to show you that particular recipe makes that amount. So you can see what you're going home with on paper is what you saw here tonight. So if you've come to my other canning class, then you know the one thing that, the first thing I talked to you about is safety. Um, there's a rule in canning that your kitchen, your rules, my kitchen, my rules. My rules are always gonna be safe canning practices. How do I know they're safe canning practices? Because this website right here, which you have in one of your handouts, is the federal government's National Center for Home Food Preservation. They set the rules for canning, and in many people's circle, they are known as the canning police, but they'll never come and police you really and truly. There's no fine for doing it your own way. However, if you want to be the safest canner you can be, follow their regulations. Um, because a lot has changed over time since your grandmother and my grandmother did canning. And one of the biggest questions that I get from a lot of people is, but my grandmother did it this way, how come I can't? How come it's deemed not safe? Let's think about it, a hundred years ago, things that people ate were so different than things that people eat now. We Americans are soft and squishy, that's the reality of life. We eat a diet that is made of a lot of processed foods, bacteria has been removed from our food because it's been so sterilized and processed. So the bacteria that grows in your gut is far softer than the bacteria that grew in grandma's gut or in pioneer's guts. They could handle a lot of germs that we'd be running to the ER with because we're sick. And that's why when we are tourists and we go to some countries, we end up getting sick because they don't process their water the same way we do. So your gut is way different than what it was years ago. So keep that in mind when somebody says, oh no, it's safe to can, my grandmother always did it. Compare with what the national regulations say because there are things that are different. And the rule in my house is there will never be a tombstone ever that says I died because I ate Dana Parfit's food. <laughs> so that's the rule that I live by. What you do in your kitchen is totally your business. If it's not safe practices, we don't have to talk about it and we can still be friends. So the one book I wanna tell you about um, before we get started is, this is the book from the federal government, from that same website group. You can get this book for free in the digital format by going to their website and downloading it. But if you're somebody who likes the paper version, you can order it for, from them for $20. So if you want it, get it. It's the best book. Many people who in, can, in the canning world say that's their Bible. These books here, our library has all of them. Feel free at the end to look at them. These are all my own personal books. Um, you'll see that there's a theme going on with all of these over here. They're all made by the Ball Company. Um, Ball is one of the main factors in safe canning. When it says safe canning, it means those recipes have been tested that they're not gonna kill you. That if you follow their directions, you're getting rid of bacteria, you're getting rid of germs, you are not gonna die from that ugly word called botulism over there. And for some people, that's the scariest word in the world, and that's why some people never want to go do canning, because it's like, oh my God, I heard about botulism. If you follow safe practices, that word's never coming in your house and never gonna be part of your vocabulary. So when we're done, feel free to look at these. Um, there's lots of great recipes for water bath canning. So water bath canning is just that. You're canning in water, and all you're doing is boiling water. Everybody in this room can boil water. Even if you don't think you can, I know you can boil water. It's simple, it's easy, the stove does it for you. That's what water bath canning is. Can you can everything in a water bath canner? No. There are safety guidelines. 
Water bath canning is for high acid foods. High acid foods, because it's about science, are fruits, fruit juices, anything that has a high acid content, or any food product that you add acid to, such as if you make salsa, you're putting vinegar or lemon juice, which is an acid. That's a water bath canning item. The pickles, because they are a vinegar base, those are all water bath cans. So many of these books have hundreds of water bath canning recipes. And I must tell you, jam is kind of like the gateway drug of canning. So if you get addicted, I apologize. But one of your handouts tells you like 20 things you can do with jam. It's not just for toast. It's a great tool for lots of other recipes. This over here is the traditional water bath canner. It is my favorite. I love it. This particular one is like 25 years old, maybe even older. Um, it's just a great pot and it has a canning rack which as you can see has had some wear and tear because it's old and it's been used. So it's a rack where you set your jars in and you put it in there. I'm not using this tonight which is I'm sure making my pot extremely sad because it's always in use, but because we're using a portable burner because we're not in a regular kitchen, that pot does not work on that burner. And I did test it, I did try it, and after an hour of not even a single bubble of water, it's like, yeah, it ain't gonna work. So if you're going to can on a portable burner, you really need a steel plated bottom pot. And that's what that one is. And that particular pot came from Ikea for like 12 bucks. So you don't have to have a fancy piece of equipment to buy this type of a pot brand new with its rack. I think they're like $25 at Walmart. So it's not a huge investment to do water bath canning. You've got to have a pot that you can cook in and you start with jars and you get a safe recipe. What other equipment do you need? This pack right here, which I know Groton Walmart does sell, um, is $10 and it comes with the only real tools that you need to have. You need to have a pair of canning tongs because when you go to take your jar out of hot boiling water, it's hot. You can't pick it up with your hand. You have no other tool at home that you can grab a jar and safely lift it out. You need jar lifters. So that set right there has a set of jar lifters. It also has a canning funnel, which is down on that end down there that we'll use. And it has this tool right here, which this is called, using it on this end, a debubbling tool because we want air bubbles out of our food. And on this end, it has a measuring tool where you measure the head space in your jar. Every safe tested recipe is going to tell you what head space you need in a jar. And the reason you need head space is you need a little air, but not a lot of air, and the type of product you use depends on how much air goes in. Jams need a quarter of an inch. Pickles need a half an inch. Things that you do into a pressure canner, which aren't for us tonight, those need more than a half an inch, sometimes an inch to an inch and a half, depending on their head space. So this tool helps you measure it. The more you can, the more you learn where the little lines kind of measure up on your jar, and you don't use it as much. But if you're going to buy any tools, that pack right there is a great investment because you need this. You can't can without it. Please don't try to. Because when you drop that glass jar and it's full of hot, sticky stuff, you're going to be cleaning up glass forever. <laughs> so um, the other thing I want to tell you before we get started, um, we've got our water going here in this pot. Um, so what do you need for jars? Um, it depends on what your recipe says. Um, the rule is a recipe is going to tell you, such as when you turn to the recipe you have, it says the yield is two to three half pints, I think. Um, yep, half pints. Um, and a half pint jar is a one cup jar. If I wanted to make my jam in a jar that's bigger, then I need to find out if that recipe is safe for that, a larger jar. Some are, some are not. You can always go down a size in jar. You can't go up a size unless you find it tested in a recipe somewhere because it becomes a density issue. And if the density in the food doesn't reach the temperature of killing bacteria, then it might seal properly, it might look good, 
but you didn't reach that center core of being perfected for temperature, so your product won't be safe. So always follow the jar size that it tells you to, remembering that you can go to smaller jars if you need to. Um, and smaller jars are great for lots of different things, so don't be afraid to use them. All right. Our water is good and hot, so Kristen, if you can deliver, and this lovely lady who's coming down the walkway in just a moment with our jam and our jars is my daughter-in-law, Kristen, who has graciously agreed to help and be my assistant, and she does a lot of running for me, which is great. <laughs> so, um, so what I have done is I have taken that jam recipe that you have right there in your, in your packet, and I have had that cooking in the kitchen while we were setting up everything. So the jam is all cooked, and now it's ready to put into the jars. So Kristen's going to bring it right here to this red spot here. Now, I'm trusting that everyone here can follow a recipe. And most canning recipes are really simple in the sense that they give you very step-by-step, -step, thank you, sweetie, step-by-step -step directions. And these jars have been washed and warmed. Because we are water bath canning and because we are canning in general, you don't have to sterilize your jars. That's an old tale that has been passed to the side. As long as you are water bathing for more than 10 minutes, or for 10 minutes or more, you are killing all the germs that need to be killed in that. You just need to make sure you start with clean jars. So the very first thing, this is a half pint jar. When you take your jars out, every time they're reusable, over and over again, you're going to wash them, and you're going to check the rim. You cannot use a jar that has a chip or a crack. It might still be a great looking jar, and you might use it for nails in your basement or buttons in another room, but it can't be used for canning if this rim is no longer stable. Because your lid, which now I want to get my lids over here, do our whole process. So each jar is topped with a lid and a ring. Now these are called regular mouth jars. There are two sizes of jar mouths, regular and wide. Jars come in all different sizes and shapes and even colors now, but the mouth of them is either a regular or a wide. So when you buy a dozen jars, it's going to come with a lid and a ring to start with, which is great. You've got everything you need. You've got your water bath canner. You've got your tools you need. You've got a box of jars that come with everything. Perfect. This piece can only be used once. Once you open that jar, such as we open the jars down there, that lid has to be thrown away for using for canning. You could still use that lid for other things but not for canning. A lot of people dehydrate foods and use lids for that. Canning, it's a one-shot lid, and that's because it has this lovely rubber glue right here. And I have two different types of lids here. This one you can see really well because that's a blue one. So this is a lid that's made by Ball. It comes with these jars because they're all made by Ball. This lid is made by Superb Canning Company. It's an American company. It's a thicker lid, and the glue on it is much thicker. Um, so when you hear it seal, it makes a different sound. It's a great lid. There are a lot of bad lids out there. And how do you know a good lid from a bad lid? You have to be able to see the glue. You can't see the glue unless you buy it and open it. So be cautious. During the lovely pandemic and things being shut down, a lot of lids were flooded the market that were made in China that had spots of glue on them, not a whole seal of glue. They were set up on websites that made you think they were approved by Ball, so a lot of people got taken by bad lids. So make sure that your lids actually say Ball on them, or there's Superb, there's Four Jars, there's about five other American-made companies that do lids. The reason why I want to stress to buy an American-made lid the United States is the only company that has food regulations for canning. So what they do in other countries isn't the same standard that we do. So therefore, they make their own rules about 
how much glue they think should go on it, how much it shouldn't, how long is it going to hold, what conditions you should use. So if you want to meet safety standards, always buy American lids. That's, that's my plug for American products. Other things, I'm not so opposed to, but for that, yes. So we just, Kristen just took these jars out of hot water because we don't want to shock all these things by having warm jam, warm water, and a cold jar. You want your jar to be warm as well. So I take my canning funnel, which comes in that lovely box with the other products, and it fits perfectly on that regular mouse because that's what it's designed to. And then we fill up our jam. And how much do I know needs to go in there? Well, my recipe tells me that it's a quarter of an inch. So I can get my measuring tool once I have it in here. <coughs> and you see I put two scoops in there and I know I need more. So now I have a little bit more. I take this end because I can see that there are air bubbles and I want to try to get them out because air bubbles will give you a false sense of oh, I'm at a quarter of an inch. Oh, I got all those bubbles out and my jam sank down some more, so I had some air bubbles in there. And now that I have it all in there, sometimes we need to take, and we need to take this off and look, I need just a little smidge more in there to be at the right mark. So now I'm at that right, correct mark, and that is my jar. So now I'm gonna fill a few more jars and on your recipe, it will tell you to fill hot jam immediately into your jar. Um, that's great, but hot jam is like burning sugar that will blister you terribly. It's okay to wait a few minutes and let that jam cool for a few minutes and settle for a few minutes. It doesn't instantly have to go into the jar. I have a friend who was constantly getting burned because the minute she turned it off, she was getting it into those jars, dripping things on her, always having little burn marks all around. And it's like, no, it's okay if it sits for a few minutes. It's, it's not going anywhere, and it's okay. You know? And sometimes, once it sits for a few minutes, you'll see that it, it's perfectly fine. It's a great product. Um, so this is jam, and you will find in all of these recipes, there are jelly, jams, preserves, marmalades, conserves, and fruit butters. How do you know the difference between all of them? Well, in the beginning, you probably don't. <laughs> so, but if you think about jelly, go back to the old Welch's jelly, the standard of America for what seemed like forever. It's just kind of like thick jello. It doesn't have chunks of fruit. It doesn't have pieces of fruit in it. It's just jelly. And jelly is made only with the juice so that you cook your fruit down, squeeze out all the bits of juice, and then you're making jelly. So that recipe, and Kristen, I'll ask you to take this one for us and this one. Thank you, darling. Um, put that one down there. So there's a, there's a little bit more that if I were at home, I would scoop that right out, put that into the refrigerator, and keep going. But I have filled three jars with that, re with that recipe. So the recipe that you have, you've just seen three jars is what it is filled. Now, I can't just put the lid on these jars because the recipe has sugar in it. Sugar can cause our glue not to seal. Anything that is sticky of any kind can cause your seal to fail. So what we have, white vinegar. The vinegar that you're always going to use in canning, any type of white vinegar that suits your fancy, doesn't matter what brand it is, however you have to read and it has to be 5% acidity. If it's not 5%, then it's not deemed safe for canning. So I take my cloth that I've just soaked with vinegar and then I go around and I wipe the whole lids right off, making sure that nowhere on my lid is there any jam residue, anything that might impede my seal. 
And that guy is definitely messy, so let's give him another squeeze. Well, now I'm going to be washing the tablecloth because I just got vinegar on it. <laughs> all right. So once those are all set, then we take our lid. Now these lids have been washed and are ready to use. Years ago, when my grandmother did canning and a lot of other people did, um, you had to boil your lids to keep them hot. That was because of the type of glue that was on there had to be softened. Now the type we have is designed to be set it, pop it right in. So now I have a lid on, uh, I have a lid. Now I'm putting my ring on. I put my ring to what's called fingertip tight. I just go like this and as soon as I feel it grab, I stop. I don't want to crank it on there because it needs some room for that air to pull out while it is sealing. So we put the ring on just fingertip tight, which for me is nice because I've got arthritis in my wrist, so tighten them down, fingertip tight is good. So now I have my three jars and I am ready to water bath them. I need my tongs because they're not going in there without them. So whatever water bath canner you use, whether it's this guy down here who has a rack or it's a pot that you have at home, the jars cannot sit flat onto the bottom of the pot because they will get too much heat at the bottom and not enough at the top. So you have to have some kind of a rack. You can purchase racks separately in different sizes. You can order them online. You can get them in any place that sells canning supplies. You can also use a cake rack in your pot. Now this pot, the very bottom is smaller than the middle part. So this one fits very nicely in here for me. Oh, my glasses will fog up now. <laughs> so I drop my rack right down in there, and it's nice and sitting there. Now I just take my jar, which picks up really nice with the jar lifters, and I set it right down in there. Kristen, I'm going to need some more hot water. So if you can bring me hot water. In all of our testing earlier with getting the pot to work, we forgot to put more water in our pot. So the rule is you have to have more than an inch of water over your jar. If you don't, you're not canning. You're just boiling the bottom of the jar. It's got to have at least an inch of water over your jar. So Kristen's going to bring me some more water. We will turn this up to high. The water will come to boil. Now you'll see on your recipe it says to process for 10 minutes, correct? I think it's a 10 minute recipe. Yep, at the bottom it says process for 10 minutes. I just put these into the hot water. I'm not starting my timer now. My timer begins when the water starts to boil. So that's why you want to get your water really hot ahead of time. It doesn't have to be boiling when you put them in there but it's got to come to a boil and then you start your 10 minutes once it is boiling. So then we do 10 minutes of boiling. Then we will stop our timer and take them right out. So we're waiting for water for a minute. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you while we're in our in-betweens? Hmm. Beautiful. Oh, I can tell you where the, the thank you darling. Nice hot, hot. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. All right. So now we wait a few minutes for that to boil. So the berries that were in the jam that you ate, um, those berries came from Whittles. Um, the berries that I have in other jars back there came from Grant's Berry Patch. So they're all local berries. Um, and that's one of the benefits of being able to can is you know where your foods come from. You know what's in it. That recipe has three things in it for jam. It's blueberries, it's sugar, and it is lemon juice because it needs a little extra acid. Although blueberries do have a high content of um, pectin. And that's the next thing I want to tell you about for jam. Um, you will see a lot of recipes will call to add pectin. And some of you might know what pectin is and some don't, and that's okay. Um, pectin is a natural substance in fruits that causes it to thicken and gel. Um, but some fruits don't have a lot of pectin in them, so you need to add it, or you're going to cook that fruit until it's almost down to nothing. 
Um, there are two different types of pectin. There's a powdered pectin and a liquid pectin. What you use is based on the recipe you choose and your own personal preferences. If you're a person who says, I don't want to use pectin, well, pectin's made with natural sources. However, some pectins do can contain other sugars that people don't want. Um, so it's totally personal preference as to what you do and don't do. Uh, but if you're using a jam that doesn't use any pectin, then you have to remember that you're going to cook your fruit a lot longer, so your yield is going to be much smaller than if you had used pectin. Um, Ball makes a pe pectin in their own products. Um, sure Gel, Clear Gel, um, they're, they're all out there in the grocery stores um, for that. All right, so now we set the timer. And a timer is one of the most valuable things ever in canning because you're going to forget what's happening, no matter what you think. Um, I will start talking. I will answer the phone. I will do all kind of other things and not remember that I had something in the canner. So in my house, I use Alexa the most. I'm forever. Alexa, set the timer. Set the canner timer. Set this. So, but phones are great canners. A great timers for canners, but you must have a timer because you can't just wing it and say, oh, I think that was 10 minutes. If you're not getting that full 10 minutes, then you're not guaranteeing that you are getting rid of the bacteria. Thank you, thank you. I rushed it. You're so good, you're so good, beautiful. So this is going to run for a few minutes. And, um, so, so what I'm going to start doing right now, so we can move right along, is I'm going to fill the jars for pickles. And same thing we did before, just a little differently. What we have now, we cooked our pickle brine, which ultimately becomes delicious pickle juice. And, you know, some kids like to drink it, some kids like to use it in lots of things. You will see again in your list of recipes that there are lots of things you can do with pickles other than just eat them. Somebody said, why would you make 24 jars of pickles? Well, because, you know, we eat a lot of pickles and we do a lot of things with them. So we took the brine, we brought it to a boil, and the brine is listed right there. It's made with sugar, vinegar, three different um, spices that are in there. So I get my pickles in there, which are really still cucumbers, but I like to pretend they're pickles already. And now you can see I've got them sticking up. However, when I take my tool and I adjust them a little bit, because there's lots of gaps in there. And pickles are one of those things that they do end up having gaps, and that's okay, um, because you're gonna fill it with brine. But you try to get them down so that they're not sticking up so badly. And then I see my line, which is right there, and I've got one or two that are still sticking up, so I need to work them down. Those are good. So that one gets to be set aside. Now, if you notice, I'm only, I'm using a slotted spoon and I'm scooping just those cucumbers because I want to get the cucumbers in there and then put the brine on top of them. That scoop did very nicely. I'm going to leave you alone for the moment. So this was 10 cups of cucumbers, which really was not. Um, I am not a huge fan of putting onions and pickles together. I like them separate, but I don't like them together. So that particular recipe calls for um, 10 cups of cucumbers, and I think it says three or four onions that you slice. I omit the onions and add an extra cucumber. So you can do that with your recipe, and it's still deemed safe because you haven't changed the ingredients in the brine. If I said, I don't like the vinegar in my pickles, and I wanted to change that, then I have a problem because a cucumber is a low acid vegetable, which means I could not can cucumbers by themselves. I need to have an acid to go with them. I think I'm going to need about three more jars, ma'am. So because 
I just left out another vegetable, I'm still okay. But I could not alter the vinegar. You can add more sugar because that doesn't matter if you want super, super sweet pickles. Um, you can reduce the sugar if you don't want super sweet pickles. But you cannot change the vinegar because that is your acid. And I'm still watching my timer that says there's five more minutes. So we're in good shape. All right. All right. So we start to work these guys down. Main thing is you don't want to fill all of your jars because you might find that you've got to add quite a few more. Once you've worked them down, got your air bubbles out. Ultimately, it's not rocket science. Trust me, they do that at EB, not here. So you're just getting them into the jar. Yes, because it's a pickle and they're oddly shaped, they're not going to stack neat and tidy in one spot. You're never going to get every air bubble out but you're going to fill brine all in those places, so then you will be good. So now I see that I need a few more in these jars. We did not boil or cook the cucumbers. We just dropped them into the brine. Um, the cucumbers, One is going black. All right, there you go. I still got three minutes. The jam, once it's made today, is all set, ready to eat. It's ready to go. Pickles need to cure. So for a sweet pickle, they're going to need two weeks. It's going to be the longest two weeks of your life to eat those pickles because you really want to eat them. Wait for them. They'll taste okay. All right, now my Nope. Thought it was my timer, just the email. All right, darn, got excited. If it is a pickle that is made with uh, a dill pickle, sour pickle, or a garlic type of pickle, you gotta wait six weeks for those, which seems like a long time. However, the key is the longer you wait, the better those will taste. I have friends who make what they call garlic pickles each summer and they wait at least six months before they eat them and they are much better after the six month mark <laughs> they truly are the key is having to wait that long for a pickle nah, I don't know I don't know if I can do that I really don't all right so now we have pickles in jars we have two more minutes on a timer Maybe another pickle in that jar So if any of you know of a location that might loan us their kitchen, um, please be happy to tell me about it because we have had a big request for doing pressure canning um, for just that same reason. People are terrified the canner's going to pop its top. Um, and it won't because safety guidelines with canners now are made far differently than they were before. They have safety guidelines. So now I go back and I slowly fill in some brine so that it does not run all over me in the table and it doesn't flow out of there. One nice thing is the ladle that I have tells me it's a six ounce ladle right on it so I know that I can't put this full ladle full if I've already used up part of that eight ounce jar. So that's a nice thing to have is a ladle that tells you how much you're, you're gushing along with. And I have a couple of different ladles. I have one that is, uh, I want to say it's a 10 ounce ladle. And don't you know, once I grabbed it by mistake and wasn't pretty. It was not. It was sticky everywhere. Um, the, the one thing to do is 
Make sure that you double check your jars each time that you have put juice in all of them um, because a jar with no juice will ultimately have to be thrown out um, because it won't, if it seals properly, it will not ferment the pickles. Uh, so you'll end up with mushy cucumber and no flavor. Um, and sometimes when you're filling them, it does become, oh wait, it looks like there's stuff in there. Is there really? Is there not? So you try and do a left to right type of thing so that you're filling on the proper side. Whatever system works for you. Um, I have a small kitchen at home, so I have a system, ah, there's our timer, where it's always going from one side to the other. So now, we turn off our burner, but we don't take it out at this moment. It has to sit for five minutes. And you think, oh my god, I still have to wait five more minutes? Well, let me tell you about pressure canning. To make that ugly chicken in pressure canning, you're canning for 90 minutes in a pressure canner. It first has to build up its pressure, which is going to take you 20 minutes. Then after you've canned your 90 minute time, it's going to take 20 minutes for that pressure to release. So you're talking from start to finish, you could easily be spending three hours canning. So you also have to make sure, oh look, say, I just ran that one over, like I said not to do, that you have plenty of time to do your canning. All right, so everybody's good and everybody's headspace is still in the same zone. And I have some very sticky jars. Um, so now we're going to wipe them down again with our vinegar on our cloth to make sure that anything comes off because that brine has sugar. And sugar is the biggest culprit for making glue not stick. It just becomes sticky mess and then your lid doesn't seal. If your lid doesn't seal, you've got two options for that jar. You can get a new lid, clean your jar up, reseal it, or you put it in your fridge and you use it right away, a couple of weeks, that type of thing. Um, How do you know whether it's sealed or not? That's what we're going to talk about when we take those out. You're right on top. <laughs> uh, let's see. All right, Kristen, if you'd like to bring the cart and remove all of those guys. That would be terrific. Thank you so much. And if you could bring me, when you come back, not rushing, um, two of the jars from the gray bin, that would be great. What jars? Uh, anything that's filled with lids. Good. All right, so now I have wiped them all up. I'm putting these on here. We're going to be ready to take out our others in two minutes and 40 seconds. Let's see. All right. And then we remember we're only doing finger tight so that once it grabs, we stop. Rings are reusable. You can use them over and over again until you can see this guy, he's got a little bit of rust on him. He's still good to use as long as he grabs. If you have a lid that you put on it and it kind of sticks, it kind of shifts, toss him, he's done. But as long as they still roll, they're good to keep going. And you will find rings seem to multiply. They're like everywhere. <laughs> I have a box and then it's like, wait, they don't fit in this box anymore, they need another box. It's like, no. All right, so now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is what we got from that recipe. I don't know what it says on the recipe, but we got nine of the half pints. Uh, yes, you can set those away. All right, so these are blueberry jam. Oh, and you. You, you did so great. She brought us one of each lid, so that was even better. You're good, you're good. So these are blueberry jams that were made earlier this week. Um, how do you know that they've sealed? It's kind of concaved in, it's pressed in, and what we will soon hear is when we take these jars out of here, it's called canning music. 
you will hear a ping when your jar seals. Now, why am I taking off the ring? Because once your jar is all sealed, you don't want to leave the ring on it. And you'll be like, why? My grandmother always left her rings on there. My grandmother would really be pissed off at me if I took the ring off, truthfully. Well, our friends in the government did testing, and it makes sense. If, for any reason, I had a little bit of jam left here on this jar, and I didn't wash it properly before putting it away, and my lid were on here, it's sitting on my shelf in a dark place, mold could grow out there and push that lid right off, but because my lid, my ring is on there, I wouldn't notice that the lid has pushed off a little bit and mold could be growing in my jar. This way, if there's anything that causes my lid to come unsealed, you're gonna notice it. It's not gonna be pushed in anymore. That lid might shift and, and wiggle and you're, uh-oh, that lid had a problem, now I've got to throw that product away. I can't take the chance. So always, after the given time, all right, are you there? It just rang. All right, that's what I thought I heard was a beep. All right, so get my other box. All right. So at home, you are going to take your jars out and you're going to set them on your counter, on a space where you can't move them for basically 24 hours. Because we can't leave it here for 24 hours, we're putting it in a portable box. However, we always want to put a towel down because of two reasons. The jars are gonna still have moisture and wetness. The other thing is at home, you might have a marble countertop. Marble countertops get very cold you're gonna shock your jar and break it by putting a hot jar onto that cold countertop. Always use a dish towel, bath towel, whatever works for you, or a lot of people will use a wooden cutting board to put their things down because that's gonna neutralize it. So we take it out, we give our lid a good shake. The water has stopped bubbling. Now, there's still some water on top of this. I am so tempted to tip it over and dump it off that's part of the sealing process. You want to leave that right there. That jar is going to be very hot and it's going to be just like our sidewalks after that summer rain. It's going to sizzle that water very quickly and that helps with that final sealing. So we just let the jar drip for a second and then we set it right down. Now usually within 10 to 15 minutes that seal is going to pop and you'll hear it. Sometimes, depending on what size your jar is, how much you've got in it, it can take much longer time. But usually, within the first half hour, you're going to have them there. All right, so now we're going to do the same exact thing. And Kristen, I'm sorry to say I need more water. Well, maybe not, because I got more jars. So the water level is going to come up. Eh, it's going to be perfect. And that's the one thing you have to think about. Don't fill your pot all the way full and then put 10 jars in there. Um, it's going to run over and you're going to have a mess to clean up. So that, that's why they always tell you to fill your canner about half to two thirds full. I, I like to try and measure my jar and think, you know, okay, this is, but that one over there, I know exactly where the levels are because I've used it so long. This pot I haven't used as much for canning, so it's a little different. So now all of my jars are submerged in water. I turn the heat back up to high, and we just have to wait for it to come to a boil. And we'll do the exact same thing. They will go for 10 minutes. We will take them out. Right now I can see on these lids, the bubble is kind of up. So none of those have sealed yet, but they will shortly. So what else have we got? Wait time. Canning is all about waiting. Um, and cleaning up, always. Um, and that's the other thing, um, don't, don't start a day of canning um, with your dishwasher full, your sink full, um, you need all that space. You've got to start with your kitchen being clean or you're going to have a disaster. So make sure your dishwasher is empty, make sure the sink is empty. Um, if you don't have a lot of counter space, clear off as much as you can or set up a portable table um, in your space because you need a spot that you can put your jars that you're not going to touch till tomorrow. The general rule is eight hours, don't touch your jars. 
because they're still sealing and that, steel, that seal is still soft for that eight hours. So even though you hear it pop and you know it's sealed, if you played with it, jiggled it, that glue is not firmly set yet. So you need to let them sit for eight hours. After eight hours, you want to check them all to make sure that every lid is depressed and not depressed, but depressed. <laughs> so, and if it isn't, that's when you then have to decide, are you going to reprocess it or are you going to put it in your fridge to eat it? After 24 hours of that jar not being played with, disturbed, no matter how much you want to look at it and idle it and say, oh my god, I did it and it's beautiful, it's wonderful, leave them alone. When your 24 hours comes, you take your rings off and you wash your jar. And that always is like the weirdest kind of thing. It's like, I have to wash the jar? Yes, because you could have still had some jam that was down on the side that when you put it on your shelf could then start to mold and cause a problem. You don't, you're not putting it in the dishwasher, you're not putting it in a deep bucket of soapy water. You can take just a sponge, squeeze a little dish soap on it, run it around on the top, and then rinse it off, and you're good. Then you're going to store these. Your rings go into wherever your magic storage space is going to be. Your jars then need to store in a cabinet, a cupboard, a shelf, that they're not getting lots of light. Light is harmful for canning goods. How long will this last? Almost like forever. Uh, the federal government will tell you this product is good for two years at its best quality. After that, the flavor might diminish, but it might not. It's still safe to eat as long as that seal has not been broken. I have jam in my house that is probably five years old, and if I opened it tomorrow, it would still taste just the same as when it was made. So that each year, we rotate out what we make and what we don't make for jams and jellies. Um, so at our house, we haven't done raspberry in a couple of years, and now the stash is getting really low, and there's one person who's complaining a lot because that's their favorite. So I know that sometime in the next few weeks, we're going to do raspberry jam. Um, just because it's there. Um, so, but seriously, if you make a lot of jam, what do you do with it? Well, turn right over to that handout, and you can see. Jam is fruit and sugar. It's nothing more. It's not anything crazy or wild. It's just jam and sugar. You can make almost anything with it. You can stir it into yogurt, into oatmeal, you know, kids love all those oatmeal swirl type of breakfast deals, and you can do that with your jam. You can make ice cream sauce with it. You can, any of these things that are listed on there on that handout, you can do with jam. And it's, it's just jam, and it's wonderful because it's fruit and sugar. And our water is just starting to boil. So now we set our 10 minutes. Um, what I see, and I'm going to touch that one, I'm going to dry this one off, is this lid right here has sealed, and now it is now depressed in. I was probably chatting too much for you. Here's a lovely little ping. So that, that, but those, those are all sealed. They're ready to go. They're jam in that. And look, all we did was boil water. Everybody can boil water, really and truly. My sister was a absolute certain she could never boil water but anybody can boil water it's simple it's easy all you need is a timer and you can do it so now there are our pickles and they will sit in here I think I'm, this is a little yeah, move those right out of the way and again it was just boiling water so I know you can do it. I have faith in all of you. You sat through this whole evening listening to me ramble, so you can boil water. I know you can. And there we have done canning. So you have successfully been through water bath canning. It's just boiling water. Don't let it intimidate you. Don't let those scary words get to you. You can do it. Um, just make sure you follow safety rules. And on that last word of safety rules, there is 10 tons of sheer crap out there on the internet and YouTube about how you can can in all these different ways and deals. 
If you see a video and you question, go to the national website and check it out. Is what they're saying correct or is it not? Because there are lots of people giving you misinformation about what you can and can't do. Um, use safe food so that you're going to be safe. Um, so please be safe and I'm so happy you could come. Thank you.